Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good day to you. This is Dr. Gaurav Agnihotri and today I am going to give a talk on the anterior triangle and its subdivisions. Anterior triangle of the neck and its subdivisions. Well, the neck is a very fragile portion of the body and it is an exposed part of the body and it is supporting the weight of the overlying head. So, this is very much uh, vulnerable to injury and many vital structures are passing through the neck. So, damage to this area can uh, be fatal also and in case injuries take place in this region, one must be aware regarding the uh, location of the different components here because uh, and proper awareness will only lead to proper intervention and can save the life of the patient. So, the neck is divided arbitrarily into two triangles. One is the anterior triangle and the other is the posterior triangle. The line of demarcation is essentially a muscle called sternocleidomastoid. So as the name of the muscle itself is indicating, it is sternocleidomastoid. It arises from the sternum and the clavicle and this muscle goes and gets attached to the mastoid process. So if you see the lateral aspect of my neck from the mastoid process, to the sternum and to the clavicle, this my hand is now separating the anterior triangle from the posterior triangle. The posterior boundary of the posterior triangle is this muscle at the back called the trapezius. So anterior triangle lies anterior to the sternocleidomastoid. Now this region, the anterior triangle of the neck is more important compared to the posterior triangle of the neck because all the vital structures like the arteries, the carotids, the respiratory passage, that is all lying in relation to the anterior triangle as compared to the posterior triangle. So the anterior triangle injuries are more important compared to the posterior triangle injuries. Also the other clinical manifestations associated with the anterior triangle, uh, there may be a swelling in relation to the anterior triangle. Now this swelling may be a cystic swelling or it may be a lymph node enlargement. The fact is that more than 75% of lateral neck masses in patients older than 40 years are caused by malignant tumors. And the incidence of malignancy continues to increase with age. So any swelling in this region has to be viewed with suspicion, particularly in persons who are older in age because malignancies are common in this region. So this region is important because of trauma. This region is important because it is prone to injury. And there may also be some other tumors associated with this region. Uh, for example, a carotid body tumor may be found in this region or there may be a swelling in this region. Now if there is a swelling in this region, one needs to ascertain whether it is a cystic swelling or whether it is a solid swelling because the management in each case is different. So today we are going to talk about the anatomical interrelationships vis-a-vis -vis the anterior triangle of the neck and uh, how uh, the vital structures are lying in the anterior triangle of the neck and how we divide this anterior triangle into further smaller triangles so that when we are trying to localize an, an injury or whether we are, when we are trying to pinpoint the location of a structure, we can use these uh, terminologies of uh, smaller triangles so that we can describe that particular area. So uh, the boundaries of the anterior triangle are shown in this slide. Uh, as you can make out, medially it is the anterior median plane of leg, laterally it is the sternocleidomastoid and superiorly is the base of the mandible and also a line joining the angle of mandible to the mastoid process. So in, the particular, in this particular slide, if you see, 
here D is representing the sternocleidomastoid. So from the median plane to the sternocleidomastoid and if we join A and B that is the line representing the base of the mandible and if we join B and C that is a line joining the angle of mandible to the mastoid process. So within this particular area the midline the base of the mandible angle of mandible to mastoid process and the sternocleidomastoid within this area lies the anterior triangle of the neck. So this anterior triangle is further subdivided into smaller triangles and the basis of division of this anterior triangle into smaller triangles is the digastric muscle and the superior belly of omohyoid. In this particular figure you can see that uh, the anterior belly of digastric is there, posterior belly of digastric is there and superior belly of digastric marked by E is there. So uh, how we divide this triangle further into smaller triangles that I will describe soon. So one of the triangles is the submental triangle. There is one submental triangle. So in our uh, in relation to our mandible anteriorly uh, there is a fossa called the digastric fossa. So we have the anterior belly of digastric which is represented by my thumb now and the posterior belly of digastric which is represented by my index finger. So if we take the base of the mandible into consideration this particular area is representing the digastric triangle. My thumb is the anterior belly of digastric, the junction between both my fingers is the hyoid bone and my index finger is representing the posterior belly of digastric. This is the base of the mandible and an imaginary line from the base of the mandible to the mastoid process if we make then this demarcates the digastric triangle in the anterior triangle. So digastric triangle is marked by 2 in the figure. Digastric triangle is marked by 2 in the figure. Then we have a median triangle which is called the submental triangle. So if we see the slide now, in slide it is marked by 1. So 1 represents the area of the submental triangle. Now if you look at me, if you look at me, this is my chin. So if I put my two index fingers like this and I join my two thumbs below, then this region is the region of the submental triangle. So a person will have two digastric triangles, one on right side, one on left side, but a person will have only one submental triangle, which is a median triangle. So if we see from the side, we see only half of the submental triangle. So submental triangle is a median triangle bounded on each side by on each side there is the anterior belly of the corresponding digastric muscle. The base is formed by the body of hyoid bone and the apex lies at the chin. So once again I am showing you my two index fingers. They are representing the anterior belly of digastric and the base is represented by the body of hyoid bone where my two thumbs are meeting. The hyoid bone lies at the level of C3 vertebra, third cervical vertebra. So there is one submental triangle, so it is a median triangle. Now this triangle also has got a floor which is formed by the right and left mylohyoid muscles. So uh, to the mylohyoid line of the mandible you have the right and left mylohyoid muscles which unite in a gutter shaped manner to form the uh, floor of the submental triangle. So the first triangle which we have studied is the submental triangle and it lies in relation to anterior belly of digastric muscle on each side and the hyoid bone is forming the base of the triangle and the apex is lying at the chin. And the second triangle is the digastric triangle which is formed by anterior belly of digastric. This is the hyoid bone, the junction of the two fingers. This is the posterior belly of digastric. So this region between the base of mandible and a line joining the angle of mandible to the mastoid process, this particular region is digastric triangle. So this anterior triangle which lies anterior to sternocleidomastoid is further divided into submental triangle, digastric triangle and there are two more triangles. One is the carotid triangle and one is the muscular triangle. So we will come to them subsequently. 
Now what are the contents of the submental triangle? Now submental triangle is formed by the two anterior valleys of digastric and base is formed by hyoid bone and apex lies at the chin. So it is marked by two in the figure. So now we do the contents of this submental triangle. Two to four small submental lymph nodes are there in this triangle. They drain the superficial tissues below the chin, central part of lower lip. So this uh, central part of lower lip and the superficial tissues below the chin, adjoining gum, anterior part of the floor of the mouth and the tip of the tongue. So submental lymph nodes are palpated just below the mentum like this. So if any swelling is there in this region, this may indicate that there is something wrong with the drainage area of the submental lymph nodes and the drainage area is the lower part of the lip, the adjoining gum, the anterior part of the floor of the mouth and the tip of the tongue. The efferents pass to the submandibular lymph nodes. Submandibular lymph nodes are lying here while submental lymph nodes are lying just below the mentum or the chin. Small submental veins join to form the anterior jugular veins. Now we come to the boundaries of the digastric triangle. As I mentioned earlier, anterior inferiorly is the anterior belly of digastric, posterior inferiorly is the posterior belly of digastric and stylohyoid and base is formed by the mandible and a line joining the angle of mandible to the mastoid process. So this is the region of my digastric triangle which is marked by two in the figure. So one is representing the submental triangle, two is representing the digastric triangle, A is representing the mentum or the chin, B is representing the angle of mandible while C is representing the mastoid process. So two triangles so far we have done, one is submental triangle and we have done the contents of submental triangle also and digastric triangle the boundaries I have explained. Now the roof of the digastric triangle is formed by skin superficial fascia. Now this superficial fascia contains the platysma muscle. Platysma muscle is a part of the paniculus carnosus. It is a subcutaneous muscle. Cervical branch of facial nerve, it supplies the platysma. Ascending branch of the transverse or anterior cutaneous nerve of the neck lies in the roof of the digastric triangle. Well the floor of the digastric triangle is formed by the mylohyoid muscle anteriorly and the hyoglossus posteriorly. So there are two muscles forming the floor of the digastric triangle. The anterior muscle is mylohyoid while the posterior muscle is hyoglossus. A small part of the middle constrictor muscle of pharynx also appears in the floor of the digastric triangle. So mylohyoid muscle I told you before also, the two mylohyoid muscles are forming the gutter shaped diaphragm in relation to the floor of the mouth. Now when we describe the uh, structures lying in the digastric triangle, we describe them under two headings, structures lying superficial to the mylohyoid and structures lying superficial to the hyoglossus. Now mylohyoid and hyoglossus are both muscles are forming the floor of the uh, digastric triangle. So the structures lying superficial to the mylohyoid are superficial part of submandibular salivary gland. As a submandibular salivary gland, you see if you take a horizontal section through this region, it has got two parts, a superficial part and a deep part and the posterior border of the mylohyoid muscle is indenting it so that this part is the superficial part and this part is the deep part. So it's a J-shaped structure which is indented by the posterior border of the mylohyoid muscle. Posterior border of mylohyoid muscle divides it into a superficial part and a deep part. So superficial part is lying above the mylohyoid muscle. Then submental artery is lying superficial to mylohyoid. Mylohyoid nerves and vessels are lying superficial to mylohyoid in the digastric triangle. The structures lying superficial to the hyoglossus are the submandibular salivary gland, the intermediate tendon of the digastric. So intermediate tendon of the digastric is that part which is lying between the anterior and posterior bellies. Now this is the anterior belly of digastric, this is the posterior belly of digastric. So this junction here in, in relation to the hyoid, it represents the intermediate tendon of digastric muscle. 
stylohyoid muscle and the 12th cranial nerve is lying superficial to the hyoglossus. So these are the contents of the anterior part of the triangle. They are structures lying superficial to the uh, mylohyoid muscle and structures lying superficial to the hyoglossus muscle. Now what are the contents of the posterior part of the digastric triangle? Uh, if we look at the posterior part of the digastric triangle, the superficial structures are lower part of the parotid gland. Parotid gland is present around the ear. So lower part of the parotid gland comes in relation to the posterior part of the digastric triangle. External carotid artery before it enters this gland. And then there are deep structures passing between internal and external carotid arteries. Now what are these deep structures? There are five structures. One is styloglossus, stylopharyngeus, glossopharyngeus nerve, pharyngeal branch of vagus nerve, styloid process and a part of the parotid gland. So the deep structures I repeat once again are the muscles, two muscles, styloglossus, stylopharyngeus, the nerve, glossopharyngeal nerve, another nerve, the pharyngeal branch of vagus nerve, styloid process and a part of the parotid gland. Now submandibular lymph nodes, they constitute an important component of the digastric triangle. Now what are the, what is the area of distribution of these uh, submandibular nodes that we should try to understand? The center of the forehead, the nose and the sinuses associated with the nose. What are the sinuses associated with the nose? Frontal sinus, maxillary sinus, ethmoidal air sinuses, inner canthus of the eye, upper lip, anterior part of the cheek, underlying gum and teeth, outer part of lower lip and teeth excluding the incisors and anterior two-third of the tongue excluding the tip which is drained by submental lymph nodes. So this is the area of drainage of the submandibular lymph nodes. Now the third triangle lying within the anterior triangle is the carotid triangle. So if we try to see the location of the carotid triangle, on one side is the anterior border of sternocleidomastoid, on one side is the posterior belly of digastric. So if this was representing the anterior and posterior, on one side is the posterior belly of digastric, on one side is the posterior anterior margin of sternocleidomastoid, then this base is formed where my two thumbs are meeting, this base is formed by the superior belly of omohyoid. So the digastric is lying, digastric, this uh, carotid triangle is lying like this. This represents the posterior belly of digastric. My this finger represents posteriorly the anterior margin of sternocleidomastoid and my thumbs, they are representing the superior belly of omohyoid. So you can see here, posterior belly of digastric, anterior margin of sternocleidomastoid, I'm moving the posterior belly of digastric out now, goes in, Ante anterior margin of sternocleidomastoid out now, goes in, and this is superior belly of omohyoid. So this is the location of carotid triangle. This is important because you see, you see in the figure, the internal jugular vein, common carotid artery dividing into internal and external carotid arteries, all this lies in relation to the carotid triangle. So this is a very important uh, triangle where many vital structures are lying. So once again, I reiterate the boundaries of the carotid triangle, anterior superiorly posterior belly of digastric and stylohyoid, anterior inferiorly superior belly of omohyoid and posteriorly anterior border of sternocleidomastoid muscle. The roof of the triangle is formed by skin and superficial fascia containing the muscle platysma once again, along with its nerve supply, the cervical branch of facial nerve. Another nerve there is the transverse cutaneous nerve of neck. Then investing layer of deep cervical fascia is also present in the roof. Floor is formed by three muscles, thyrohyoid, hyoglossus and middle and inferior constrictor muscles of pharynx. Now if you see the slide, I'll show you how the floor of the uh, carotid triangle is formed. Here E represents the thyrohyoid muscle, A is representing the constrictor, middle constrictor is represented by A and B is representing the inferior constrictor muscle. 
So these, this diagram is showing the structures forming the floor of the carotid triangle. So arteries in this triangle, the common carotid artery with the carotid sinus and carotid body at its termination, internal carotid artery, external carotid artery with its branches. So you see in this triangle, you've got the common carotid artery, which is represented by A and it's dividing into external carotid artery represented by B and internal carotid artery, which is represented by C. So external carotid artery is giving the different branches. The first branch being the ascending pharyngeal branch, then medially and then on the lateral side, it is giving superior thyroid, then above it is the lingual, then still above it is the facial, on the medial side is the, so, so different branches of external carotid artery are there. So this carotid triangle contains the vital structures. Then internal jugular vein, common facial vein draining into the internal jugular vein, a pharyngeal vein which may end either in the internal jugular or common facial vein and lingual vein are also the contents of the carotid triangle. So if you see again here, uh, actually there is a uh, sheath of fascia known as the carotid sheath which is uh, enclosing the common carotid artery and the internal carotid artery and the internal jugular vein. D here is representing the internal jugular vein. So the blood vessels are present in relation to the carotid triangle. So we see also the branches of the external carotid artery. The first branch is the ascending pharyngeal branch on the medial side. And uh, we also see the lingual nerve which has got a, a lingual artery which has got a tortuous course uh, arising from external carotid artery. Uh, so these are the different and we see the termination of the external carotid artery, the termination of B as the superficial temporal and maxillary arteries. So all these structures, you know, they are lying in relation to the carotid triangle. Then the carotid triangle also has got nerves in relation to it. If you see in the figure, the vagus nerve is running vertically downwards. So it's represented by 10. So we see the ninth nerve also there and uh, 10A is representing the pharyngeal branch of uh, vagus nerve which is lying there. Then we have got the uh, superior laryngeal nerve, which is dividing into I and E. I and E represent the internal and external laryngeal nerves. We have got the hypoglossal nerve, that is the 12th nerve, which is also lying in this carotid triangle. And below we see the ansa cervicalis, which lies in the anterior wall of the carotid sheath. So this ansa cervicalis has got an inferior root, which we are able to see and we also see the loop of the ansa cervicalis. And at the upper angle, we see the spinal accessory nerve as it is passing from the anterior triangle, carotid triangle into the posterior triangle of the neck. The spinal accessory nerve is marked by 11. So there is a plethora of nerves, a plethora of nerves associated with the car carotid triangle. And they are all important nerves. The ninth nerve, the 10th nerve with its different branches, the 11th nerve, the 12th nerve, so these four important nerves, you know, 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th, they are all lying in relation to the carotid triangle and uh, its vicinity. So this particular area, if a damage takes place here or trauma takes place here, it can result in uh, features associated with the nerve lesions because important nerves and important vessels are passing through this particular region. The common carotid artery divides into internal and external carotid artery at the level of the junction between uh, C3 and C4 vertebra that is at the upper border of thyroid cartilage. So if I read from the slide, the nerves related to the anterior triangle of the neck are the vagus running vertically downwards, the superior laryngeal branch of the vagus dividing into external and internal represented by I and E in the figure the spinal accessory nerve running backwards over the internal jugular vein. You can see it by uh, the number 11 here in the figure. The hypoglossal nerve running forwards over the external and internal carotid arteries. The hypoglossal nerve gives off the upper root of the ansa cervicalis and another branch to the thyrohyoid. The sympathetic chain runs vertically downwards posterior to the carotid sheath. 
So carotid sheath in its anterior wall has got ansa cervicalis while the sympathetic chain is running posterior to the carotid sheath. And what is carotid sheath? It's a fibroalveolar sheath forming a connective tissue framework around the common carotid artery, internal carotid artery. So uh, it has got an anterior wall uh, in which lies the loop of ansa cervicalis. Then lymph nodes are seen in this region. The deep cervical lymph nodes are situated along the internal jugular vein and prominent lymph nodes among these include the jugulodigastric node below the posterior belly of digastric and the jugulomohyoid node which lies above the inferior belly of the omohyoid. Now we come to the common carotid artery. The right common carotid artery is a branch of the brachiocephalic artery. The left common carotid is a branch of the arch of iota. So these questions are frequently asked by the teachers in the examinations. Uh, right common carotid artery, uh, from where does it arise and how is the origin of right common carotid artery different from the origin of the left common carotid artery. So the left common carotid artery begins in the thorax in front of the trachea opposite a point little to the left of the center of the manubrium. It ascends to the back of the left sternoclavicular joint and enters the neck. So th that is about the left common carotid artery. Now in the neck both arteries have a similar course. So each artery runs upwards within the carotid sheath under cover of anterior border of sternocleidomastoid. At the level of upper border of thyroid cartilage that is at the junction between C3 and C4 vertebra, the artery ends by dividing into external and internal carotid arteries. So in the figure here we see the external carotid artery lying away from the nerve uh, that is the 10th nerve while the internal carotid artery lying towards the 10th nerve and the internal carotid artery is giving no branch in the neck while the uh, external carotid artery is giving anterior branch, medial branch, posterior branch, terminal branches in the neck. Now carotid sinus, what is the carotid sinus? Termination of common carotid artery shows a slight dilatation known as carotid sinus. In this region, the tunica media is thin, but the adventitia is thick. So carotid sinus, what is the function of carotid sinus? It acts as a pressure receptor, what we call the baroreceptor, and it regulates the blood pressure. So that is the function of carotid sinus. Now carotid body is a small reddish brown structure situated behind the bifurcation of the common carotid artery it acts as a chemoreceptor. So carotid sinus acts as a baroreceptor responding to pressure changes while carotid body acts as a chemoreceptor and it responds to changes in the oxygen and carbon dioxide and pH content of blood. So these are the important structures present in the carotid triangle. External carotid artery is one of the terminal branches of common carotid artery. In general, it lies anterior to internal carotid artery and is the chief artery of supply to structures in front of the neck and in the face. So this is a very important artery, the external carotid artery. It begins in the upper border of thyroid cartilage, runs upwards and terminates behind the neck of mandible by dividing into terminal branches and the branches, terminal branches are superficial temporal going vertically upwards and maxillary going towards the maxilla. Then in the carotid triangle, the external carotid artery is comparatively superficial and lies under the cover of anterior border of sternocleidomastoid. Deep to the artery, the structures are the wall of the pharynx, the superior laryngeal nerve which divides into internal and external laryngeal nerve. In the figure, you can see I and E represent the internal and external laryngeal nerves. So superior laryngeal nerve is dividing into internal and external laryngeal nerves. Above the carotid triangle, the external carotid artery lies deep in the substance of the parotid gland. So it traverses the parotid gland. Now we talk about the uh, other structures. The external carotid artery gives off eight branches which may be grouped as follows. Anterior branches called superior thyroid artery. So we can make out in the figure just below the E, you have got the superior thyroid artery. So first branch of external carotid artery is actually medial, that is the ascending pharyngeal artery, which is not shown in the figure. The second branch is the superior thyroid artery, which is just lying just below the nerve E in the figure. 
so superior thyroid artery is there above it the kinked lingual artery is there it shows a kinking uh, so still above is the facial artery so these are the anterior branches superior thyroid lingual and facial they are in one direction only and they pass anteriorly the posterior branch is the occipital branch so the posterior branch is the occipital branch and uh, we have got another posterior branch posterior auricular branch above the occipital branch so and uh, the terminal branches are superficial temporal and maxillary so just uh, opposite the facial you have got the occipital going posteriorly superior thyroid artery if we describe in detail the it arises from external carotid artery just below the level of greater cornua of hyoid bone it runs downwards and forwards parallel and just superficial to the external laryngeal nerve so we see that the superior thyroid artery has got a relation with the external laryngeal nerve it passes deep to the three long infrahyoid muscles to reach the upper pole of the lateral lobe of the thyroid gland its relationship with external laryngeal nerve which supplies the cricothyroid muscle is important to the surgeon during thyroid surgery see what happens is the artery and nerve are close to each other higher up but diverge slightly near the gland to avoid injury to the nerve the superior thyroid artery is ligated as near to the gland as possible so my teachers used to explain this fact to me like this that we always want to be close to persons who are higher than us so superior thyroid artery is ligated near the gland because superior near so we always try to be close to persons higher than us superior thyroid artery is ligated near the gland because it is near the gland that the nerve is away from the artery so we don't want to damage the nerve so superior thyroid artery is ligated near the gland and opposite to this is the case with the inferior thyroid artery the inferior thyroid artery is ligated away from the gland so always remember the student should always remember that we try to be close to persons superior to us so superior thyroid artery is ligated near the gland to avoid injury to nerve while inferior thyroid artery is ligated away from the gland to avoid injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve so this fact is of surgical importance clinical importance and should be kept in mind apart from its terminal branches to the thyroid gland it gives one important branch the superior laryngeal artery which pierces the thyroid membrane in company with the internal laryngeal nerve the superior thyroid artery also gives the sternocleidomastoid branch to that muscle and a cricothyroid branch that anastomoses with the artery of the opposite side in front of the cricovocal membrane now we come to the lingual artery which has got a tortuous course so in the figure we can see the lingual artery just uh, above it is kinking sort of the it is sort of kinking the 12th cranial nerve so it arises from the external carotid artery opposite the tip of greater cornua of hyoid bone its course is divided into three parts by the hyoglossus muscle the first part lies in the carotid triangle it forms a carotid upward loop so that kink which i was talking about is the upward loop which is crossed by the hypoglossal nerve so lingual artery has got an important relationship with the hypoglossal nerve the lingual loop permits free movements of the hyoid bone so this is the importance why lingual artery is uh, tortuous in nature so to allow free movements of the hyoid bone the second part lies deep to the hyoglossus and it is superficial to the middle constrictor of the pharynx the third part is called the deep lingual artery it runs it runs upwards along the anterior border of hyoglossus its vertical course lies between genioglossus medially and inferior longitudinal muscle of tongue laterally the horizontal part of the artery is accompanied by the lingual nerve now the thing is during surgical removal of the tongue the first part of the artery is ligated before it gives any branch to the tongue or to the tonsil so this point has to be kept in mind that uh, tongue may be surgically removed in case of cancer so in that case the first part of the lingual artery is ligated 
so that is why why it is ligated because now it has not given any branch to the tongue or to the tonsil so that is the best place for ligation so this fact has to be kept in mind during tongue surgery now the facial artery it arises from the external carotid just above the tip of greater cornua of hyoid bone it runs upwards first in the neck as the as cervical part and then on the face as facial part this artery is tortuous in both the places so this is another artery which is tortuous why it is tortuous so as to allow free movements of the pharynx during deglutition and in the face free movements of the mandible during mastication and various facial expressions so free movements are possible only if the artery is tortuous so that is why god has made this uh, facial artery very tortuous in both its uh, course uh, in the face and below the artery escapes traction during these movements if this artery was not tortuous it would have gone broken down so that is why god has given that compensatory measure he has made the uh, facial artery tortuous the cervical part of the facial artery runs upwards on the superior constrictor of the pharynx deep to the posterior belly of the digastric it grooves the posterior border of the submandibular cerebral gland so yes the facial artery has got a relationship with the submandibular cerebral gland next the artery makes an s bend first winding over the submandibular gland and then up over the base of the mandible so this we will discuss in detail when we do the anatomy of the submandibular cerebral gland the cervical part of the facial artery gives off the ascending palatine tonsillar submental glandular branches for the submandibular cerebral glands and lymph nodes the ascending palatine artery arises near the origin of the facial artery it passes upwards between the styloglossus and the stylopharyngeus crosses over the upper border of the superior constrictor and what does it supply it supplies the tonsil and root of the tongue then the submental branch is a large artery which accompanies the mylohyoid nerve and supplies the submental triangle and the sublingual salivary gland so that was about the facial artery which is a tortuous artery now occipital artery is arising posteriorly opposite to the facial artery so if facial artery is arising on one side the occipital artery is arising on the other side it is crossed at its origin by the hypoglossal nerve in the carotid triangle the artery gives two sternocleidomastoid branches the upper branch accompanies the accessory nerve and the lower branch arises near the origin of the occipital artery so that was about the occipital artery now we come to the posterior auricular artery this one arises from the posterior aspect of external carotid just above the posterior belly of the digastric it runs upwards and backwards deep to the parotid gland but superficial to the styloid process it crosses the base of the mastoid process and ascends behind the auricle so the posterior auricular artery then passes behind the auricle it supplies the back of the auricle and skin over the mastoid process and over the back of the scalp so since it is lying here it is uh, going to supply the back of the auricle skin over the back of the scalp and over the mastoid process it is cut in incisions for mastoid operations because of its location here it needs to be cut whenever mastoid operations are to be done its stylomastoid branch enters the stylomastoid foramen and supplies the middle ear mastoid antrum and ear cells the semicircular canals and the facial nerve so the posterior auricular artery is an important artery as it supplies the middle ear the mastoid antrum the ear cells the semicircular canals and the facial nerve now we come to the ascending pharyngeal artery as the name indicates it's an ascending artery and it is going to supply the pharynx it's a small branch arising from medial side of external carotid actually it is the first artery arising from the external carotid and this one is not shown in the figure it's a small twig you know arising on the medial aspect from the external carotid artery it runs vertically upwards between the side wall of pharynx the tonsil the medial wall of the middle ear and the auditory tube it sends meningeal branches into the cranial cavity 
through the foramen lacerum, the jugular foramen and the hypoglossal canal. So this is the, as about the ascending pharyngeal artery which is the first branch and it is the only medial branch arising out of the external carotid artery. Now we come to the terminal branches of the external carotid artery and one of the terminal branches is the maxillary artery which is the larger terminal branch of external carotid artery. It begins behind neck of mandible under cover of parotid gland. Subsequently, it runs forward deep to the neck of the mandible below the auriculotemporal nerve and then it enters the infratemporal fossa. So this is about the maxillary artery. Now we come to the smaller terminal branch of the external carotid artery what is called the superficial temporal artery. It begins behind the neck of the mandible under cover of parotid gland runs vertically upwards crossing the root of the zygoma or pre-olicular point where its pulsations can be easily felt. About 5 cm above the zygoma it divides into anterior and posterior branches which supply the temple and scalp. The anterior branch anastomosis with the supraorbital and supratrochlear branches of the ophthalmic artery. So we have discussed and described the all the branches of the uh, sup this uh, external carotid artery and uh, uh, you have to remember that these are classified into anterior, posterior, medial and terminal branches and which area is supplied by which branch that a uh, knowledge of that is essential to comprehend this particular region. Now about the superficial temporal artery, in addition to the branches which supply the temple, the scalp, the parotid, the auricle and facial muscles, the superficial temporal artery gives off a transverse facial artery and a middle temporal artery which run on the temporal fossa deep to the temporalis muscle. So this is an additional fact regarding the superficial temporal artery. Now we come to the ansa cervicalis or ansa hypoglossi. Now what is the ansa cervicalis? It is a nerve loop. As you can see in the figure, it is formed by C1, C2 and C3. So C1 gives rise to the superior root of the ansa cervicalis that is marked by uh, A in the figure. While C2 and C3 give rise to the inferior root of the ansa cervicalis that is marked by B in the figure. And inferiorly you can see the loop of ansa cervicalis. So this ansa cervicalis lies in the anterior wall of carotid. So this ansa cervicalis is supplying many important muscles, the strap muscles. So let us, uh, let me describe it in detail. This nerve loop that lies embedded in the anterior wall of carotid sheath uh, is, is important as it supplies the infrahyoid muscles. Now this is formed by superior root marked by A in the figure and inferior root marked by B in the figure. The superior root is the continuation of the descending branch of the hypoglossal nerve. So you can see the superior root is lying in relation to 12 marked in the figure that is the hypoglossal nerve. The fibers of the superior root are in relation to the hypoglossal nerve and the fibers are derived from the C1. Its fibers are derived from the first cervical nerve. This root descends over the internal carotid artery and common carotid artery. Then the inferior root or descending cervical nerve is marked by B in the figure. Uh, its uh, fibers are derived from second and third cervical nerve. As this root descends, it winds around the internal jugular vein and then continues anterior inferiorly to join the superior root in front of the common carotid artery. So this was about the inferior root. So superior root supplies the superior belly of homohyoid. You can see that A in the figure is supplying SO. SO means superior belly of homohyoid. Now the loop that is the ansa cervicalis is supplying the sternohyoid, sternothyroid and inferior belly of homohyoid marked by SH, ST and IO in the figure. Thyrohyoid and geniohyoid marked by GH and TH in the figure are supplied by separate branches from first cervical nerve through the hypoglossal 
now so they are clearly demarcated on the left side in the figure you can see gh and th which represent the thyrohyoid and geniohyoid which are supplied by separate branches from the first cervical nerve through the hypoglossal nerve now the last triangle in the anterior triangle is the muscular triangle so this muscular triangle has also got boundaries anteriorly is the midline so there are two muscular triangles one on the right side one on the left side so anteriorly is the midline and then you have got superior belly of omohyoid and the anterior belly of sternocleidomastoid so my middle finger is representing the this finger is representing the anterior border of sternocleidomastoid while this finger is representing the index finger is representing so this vertical line is representing the midline anterior midline of the neck so this other index finger is representing the superior belly of omohyoid and the middle finger is representing the anterior border of sternocleidomastoid so this these are the boundaries of the muscular triangle which contains the strap muscle so once again the boundaries of the muscular triangle are anteriorly anterior midline of the neck from the hyoid bone to the sternum posterior superiorly superior belly of omohyoid muscle and posterior inferiorly anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle so this is the anterior triangle of the neck so in a nutshell we can say that this anterior triangle of the neck is divided into four triangles submental triangle digastric triangle submental triangle digastric triangle carotid triangle and muscular triangle by the digastric muscle and its two bellies and the superior belly of omohyoid so this uh, muscular triangle is marked by four in the figure so e represents the superior belly of omohyoid d represents the sternocleidomastoid a represents the chin one represents the submental triangle two represents the digastric triangle b represents the angle of mandible c represents the mastoid process so passing from the hyoid bone to the c is the posterior belly of digastric passing from the hyoid bone to the uh, chin is the anterior belly of digastric so this is how the four triangles are demarcated as subdivisional triangles in the anterior triangle of the neck now what are the contents of the anterior triangle of the neck the infrahyoid muscles are the chief contents of this triangle these muscles may be uh, arbitrarily regarded as forming the floor of the triangle now what are the infrahyoid muscles sternohyoid sternothyroid thyrohyoid and omohyoid their nerve supplies we have already discussed now why is this anterior triangle important so many important structures are there and we have uh, exhaustively studied them because uh, there is not a single structure you can ignore because every structure has got a clinical importance every structure is vital so 9th to 12th cranial nerves they pass through this anterior triangle the lymph nodes are there and uh, the blood vessels are there carotids are there so we cannot ignore any structure and so that is why this anterior triangle is important uh, there are swellings associated with the anterior triangle and the swelling if a swelling is there then one should make out first of all whether it is a cystic swelling or a solid swelling now cystic swelling as you see in this figure it may be due to fluid it may be due to air as in case of laryngocele uh, the fluid swellings uh, may be may be due to cystic hygroma thyroglossal cyst or it may be a brachial cyst abscesses may be there there may be blood in the swelling as in the case of hemangioma or an aneurysm so i have described the cystic swellings in this particular slide vis a vis the anterior triangle of the neck now this figure here is showing the carotid tumor now carotid tumor or chemodectoma is located on the side of the neck where the carotid artery branches into smaller blood vessels to carry blood into brain carotid body tumors constitute 65% of head and neck paragliomas so this sort of an appearance in relation to the bifurcation of the common carotid artery represents a carotid body tumor or chemodectoma or paraglioma 
Now, there may be lymph node enlargements in relation to the neck. Now, lymph node enlargements, particularly in older persons, you know, they may indicate malignancy. A thing I want to say about the swellings here in the relation to the neck, the swellings which are painful are harmless and the swellings which are painless, they can be very dangerous. So, there is a paradox here. Swellings which are painless, one needs to go in for investigations because they are more likely to be malignant while a swelling which is painful is more likely to be due to inflammation and is likely to subside with time. So, more than 75% of lateral neck masses in patients older than 40 years are caused by malignant tumors. Incidence of neoplastic cervical adenopathy continues to increase with age. In this figure, we are seeing some of the lymph nodes which are enlarged. Now, dividing the neck into different trauma zones. We all study in medical colleges. We all have studied in medical colleges. I am teaching in a medical college. So, every medical college has got an emergency wing. In that emergency wing, many cases of roadside accidents or trauma or stab injuries in the neck, they do come and immediate uh, resuscitation measures have to be taken, immediate uh, uh, treatment has to be done to save the life of the patient if possible. And for that purpose, the neck is divided into different zones. Now here in this particular figure, we can see the sternocleidomastoid and we can see the different zones of the neck. They are the anatomical divisions of the neck. And in particular, you know, these zones are important in relation to the anterior triangle of the neck. Because anterior triangle of the neck, as you can see in the figure, is containing the respiratory uh, passage. So, resp without respiration, we can't survive. So, anterior triangle has got the carotids. So, a lot of bleeding can take place and due to hemorrhagic shock, even death can take place. So, anterior triangle is very important when injuries have taken place. So, immediate uh, steps have to be taken. So, accordingly, the neck is divided into anatomical zones to assist in evaluation of neck injuries. Zone 1 extends from thoracic inlet to cricoid cartilage. So, if this is my thoracic inlet, cricoid cartilage lies at C6 level. So, this is zone 1. So, any injury here in zone 1 between my two uh, hands, this injury might be obscured because of the clothing and because of the uh, trunk extending upwards. So, injury may take place here and uh, the carotids may be injured here. Zone 2 extends from cricoid cartilage to angle of mandible. So, it extends from cricoid cartilage C6 to the angle of mandible. So, between my two uh, palms, uh, hands here, this is zone 2. Now, injuries in this particular region, they are visible, they are not obscured. And here you see uh, the carotids particularly are liable to be damaged, the respiratory pathway is liable to be damaged, the trachea is lying here anteriorly. So, uh, vital structures are here and uh, then is the zone 3. Zone 3 is lying from angle of mandible to the base of skull. So, this zone 3, here the nerve injuries are more common. The nerve injuries like 9th nerve, 10th nerve, 11th nerve, 12th nerve. So, accordingly, depending upon the extent of damage and depending upon the zone in which the damage has occurred, uh, one can evaluate the neck, neck injuries and proceed with the planning of intervention which is needed to be done to save the patient. So, today we have uh, talked about the anterior triangle of the neck and its clinical repercussion, repercussions. I know it was a bit of an exhaustive talk because uh, uh, so many structures are there in the anterior triangle of the neck. You cannot just arbitrarily divide the neck into different regions. You can say that, okay, this is digastric triangle, this is carotid triangle and not describe the structures in detail because the structures are very important, very vital and uh, their life-threatening injuries can take place to these structures. So, a comprehensive and thorough knowledge of the structures and the morphological subdivisions of the anterior triangle is a must while planning uh, effective uh, interventional therapy to save the life of the patient. And uh, I'm thank you. I'm going to thank you for sparing your time and being patient with me for this exhaustive class. I now am ready to sign off. 
till the next time we meet again thank you regards bye and namaste